Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thank you, Pepper Geesey, Carmine Bailey, and Vince Power, and you too, Bill Shields. On this episode of DTNS, a way to make air conditioning cheaper and more efficient. Boy, we could use that right now. Lab-grown meat for your pets and why you actually don't mind ads and video games. No, really, you don't. Trust me. No, you don't. <laughs> this is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, July 17th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. On the same exact date, I'm Scott Johnson in Salt Lake City. And uh, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Scott, what's the favorite thing you got for your birthday today? Uh, I got this awesome poster signed by the three principal actors in Mad Max Fury Road, uh, that being Tom Hardy, Charlize Theron, and Nicholas Hout. And I don't know how this person who gave me the, this got this, but it's like the greatest thing ever for a movie I love. And I'm never, it will never part from me. It will be here always. That's amazing. Yeah. Roger's theory is that uh, those three people were at a subway, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, yes, they were at a subway. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Eating fresh. To sign it. Yeah. It seems Having very a plausible. Three dollar yeah. dipper or whatever <laughs> that's called. All right. Uh, well, send us your theories about how Scott's Mad Max Fury Road poster got signed while we talk about the quick hits. Bloomberg reported Wednesday that its sources say the U.S. is considering the strictest restrictions allowed on sellers of chip making equipment to China. And one of the world's biggest makers of the equipment used to make chips is the Netherlands ASML. Uh, quick, if you're like, hold on, the Netherlands isn't in the United States. Uh, the U.S. can restrict anything that uses technology or parts from the U.S. as part of this. So ASML has to play along. ASML just reported earnings that beat expectations thanks to a boom in chip making. But 49% of its sales last quarter were to companies in China. Ouch. Uh, hey, reviews are out for the 12.1 inch OnePlus Pad 2. And that compares pretty favorably in these reviews to the iPad Air if you're looking for an Android alternative. It has a 3K screen, six stereo speakers, and runs on Qualcomm's latest Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 chip. Uh, this is pretty comparable to Apple's M2. There's also a $99 stylus from OnePlus and a $150 keyboard, and it starts at $550 for the tablet. It is available to order now, shipping July 31st, so pretty quickly. OnePlus also launched its 6.74-inch Nord 4 mid-range smartphone with four years of Android updates and six years of security updates. It's available for uh, right now for €499, Euros, and that's shipping August 8th. Repairs have finished on three subsea internet cables that were damaged in the Red Sea earlier this year. The cables were damaged in relation to attacks being carried out by Houthi militants in Yemen. Uh, those attacks continued as the repair ships attempted their work. Uh, so uh, risking uh, may, uh, possibly their lives, certainly damage to repair internet cables, uh, you wouldn't have thought, but there we are. Subsea cables have been subject to frequent attacks, not only in the Middle East, but also in the seas north of Europe uh, as well. And some cables in the South China Sea are considered vulnerable, and there's some worries about the integrity of those cables as well. Uh, cables can always be repaired, uh, but it takes time, and there's only 60 repair ships that exist in the world. So let's not cut them all at once. This is the kind of stuff you never think about. You yeah. Know? There's stuff under the water, and it needs to work. Yep, uh, and Google, it's not easy to get down to. <laughs> not at all. Google, and hopefully they can get Google there soon. Uh, anyway, will announce its new Pixel 9 phones on August 13th. That's not very far away either. But the Taiwanese National Communications Commission, or the NCC, included photos and specs of the Pixel 9, Pixel 9 Pro, Pixel 9 Pro XL, and the Pixel 9 Pro Fold in its filings. Among the details are the Pixel Fold getting a little taller and less square, I think that's a good thing. And a small uh, Pixel uh, 9 Pro that has a 6.1-inch screen. Android Authority or a quick search can give you the full details if you are interested. 6.1 inches. Do you call that small? I don't think that feels small. I feel Doesn't like feel we're still. Small. I feel like we're still supposed to be liking that size and not begging for anything bigger yet. But yeah. uh, Axios reports that ad company Tabula has reached a deal with Apple to sell ads in Apple News and Apple Stocks apps. 
Uh, Taboola is a fast-growing ad marketplace. If you've been looking for examples of competition for Facebook and Google, well, Taboola is an example. It will be the authorized reseller of ads for placement in those two apps, stocks and news, in all markets. So if you want to put an ad in Apple stocks, you got to talk to Taboola. You also might now know Taboola as the company that places all those oddly compelling links to empty news stories, you know, like you won't believe which celebrity just lost a thousand pounds. Did you know, Scott, that people call that the chum box? I have. I bring it up sometimes. I usually call them chum ads, but when chum I bring ads, up the yeah. term chum ads, they don't understand what I'm talking about. And I'm a little, always a little surprised because to me, it's obvious. It's kind of bottom of the barrel. Yeah. Chum is in like bad fish food. But it for attracts fish. the sharks. <laughs> exactly. So the sharks come and they get it. But yeah. I always I do look at them sometimes because I find them incredibly entertaining. So yeah. I guess good on them. I'm always that. looking to see if you're in there, but I haven't seen you yet. <laughs> I haven't so. seen you either. So yeah. I don't know what that says, but <laughs> spoke too soon. <laughs> uh, Wired has an article about a company called Montana Technologies making a product that will make your air conditioner more efficient, especially in humid climates. This is probably mostly for big uh, buildings, office buildings, retail warehouses, retail locations, et cetera, maybe hotels. Uh, but it's interesting because air conditioners have to work harder to cool humid air. Now, air conditioners already, already do try to dehumidify a little bit, but Montana Technologies' air jewel system can do it much better. It has two chambers, each coated with Montana Technologies' proprietary material that absorbs moisture efficiently. One chamber will dehumidify air while the other chamber releases the moisture it has collected. Uh, and assuming uh, you could actually do something with that water too, although they don't talk about that. Once one chamber has released all its moisture, it takes over the dehumidifying so the other chamber can start drying out. The switch happens about once every 10 minutes. The dry air is then sent to the traditional air conditioner, which doesn't have to work as hard to cool it. So AirJewel uses less than 100 watt hours per liter of water vapor removed, which makes it about 90% more efficient than the dehumidifiers you have now. Uh, and that means your AC can work less and not have to work as hard to dehumidify it. So you get a lot of energy savings out of this. Montana Technologies is marketing air jewel to HVAC makers in the U.S. as air jewel inside. Mm -hmm. uh, they're also talking to the U.S. military about using it uh, in installations there. It is still in the testing stages, but it's building pilots, so it's got prototypes. Uh, and apparently a big box retailer is one of the companies that's trying this out, Scott. Mm, I think this is interesting. I grew up in a house where we had a we had a, a swamp cooler, and the reason we could do that is because in a dry climate like where I grew up here in uh, Utah in Salt Lake City, in a little town called Sandy, we had dry weather, dry air, and though it would get hot, it was never a humid heat, and so mm -hmm. those are a pretty efficient. You can't use those in the South. Uh, I always wondered uh, as I moved around the country for the first time, and I went, "Wait, you guys don't have that down here?" And they're like, "No, we have AC, but it also just really cranks in the summer." And some people will always say, hey, how come, you know, Phoenix, they always talk about how even though it's that hot, their air conditioners are really efficient. Well, it's a very non-humid environment. So this represents a real boon to areas where this is a problem. Not only that, a basic, I guess you can see this as like a, a, humi a humidity filter, right? You're, yeah, you're right. Ta literally taking the humidity out of the process so that the, uh, the air conditioning part of it can work smarter and i think this is great and as someone who's probably on his last year of his current air conditioning oh, i'm yeah. dreading i'm really dreading this but i'm gonna have to do something soon uh, sooner than later um this interests me especially if something like this showed up at like a costco if that's it's the probably not though that's the that's the sad part of this for us as consumers yeah. is this this is probably not worth the extra cost and efficiency for individuals but at scale, right? Mm -hmm. If you're if you're doing a, a a Costco itself, if you're cool, if you're cooling the actual Costco, then it then it might be worth it. Uh, there's a bunch of other technology in this Wired article that is interesting. There's a company called Blue Frontier that uses a salt desiccant uh, for a similar dehumidifier. Uh, Nostromo is being tried out at the Beverly Hilton and the Waldorf Astoria Beverly Hills to freeze capsules of water on the roof during off-peak hours when the electricity costs less, and then at peak hours when the electricity costs more and they're doing energy-saving you know, uh, uh, encouragement, uh, you can use the ice to cool the hotel 
at a lower amount of energy. Uh, so it doesn't actually use less energy. In fact, it slightly uses more energy, but it uses it at better times. Uh, and then there's something called electrocaloric cooling, which could possibly come to consumer air conditioners. Uh, it is unfortunately only in the lab, but it uses thin strips of ceramics inside a tube filled with fluid and then adds electricity to cause, you know, in cycles to cause one end of the tube to get hot and one end of the tube to get cold. And then you could actually do it for heating or cooling. Yeah, I mean, imagine places like Vegas or, you know, anywhere where they rely on a ton of space that needs great, uh, you know, air conditioning. Um, and it doesn't sound like you got to replace the entire HVAC system. It's really just like, you know, replacing yeah. the source of where the air goes and and boom, you have a more efficient solution. I think this is great. Yeah. Uh, if anybody knows anything about me and Scott Johnson, they know that uh, the two of us have been talking about lab-grown meat for well over 10 years now, uh, here and there. We used to do a show called Forecast Together, where it came up quite often. Uh, so we had to talk about the fact that the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland has become the first European country to approve the sale of lab-grown meat for pets. Mm. <laughs> Actually, the first European country to approve the sale of lab-grown meat for any reason, but uh, the UK's Animal and Plant Health Agency and Department for Environment, Food, and Rural Affairs granted Meatly, a London-based company, the approval to sell their synthetic chicken as pet food. Uh, actually, I don't know if synthetic's the right word. Meatly mm. grows its protein from actual chicken cells. So mm. these are real chicken cells, just not a real chicken growing them. Uh, it will launch with samples this year, uh, so you can try it out. And it's going to continue to try to reduce the cost of creating this, which is the big uh, thing with keeping these from being more widely available. And it will try to increase scale to hit full production volumes within the next three years. Now, if you're saying, I thought you could just buy lab-grown meat, you could eat yourself. If you're in Singapore, Israel, or most parts of the United States, you can, should you have the means. But it's pretty expensive. Yeah, it's still really expensive. And that's my biggest hang-up with the whole thing. When we were talking about this on Forecast all those years ago, and it's probably closer to 15 years now. Is that right? Yeah, right. Jeez. Um, the same issues always came up. Like, uh, we'd have to keep reminding each other or our guests that, well, we're talking about actual meat here. We're not talking about fake meat. It's not th right. synthetic. It's not the same as impossible. It's a different, a whole different thing. It's not plant-based. It's actually meat-based. So yeah. then the big question was, well, when does this become less expensive than just getting meat? Because that's really going to be where rubber meets the road. And I feel like I would be far more interested in anything from synthetic meat to full-on uh lab grown meat if it made a cost a difference because otherwise you're just not going to get the average consumer excited about it so that's a big thing but in this case where it's for animals um i think that scales really well like you you could see this if it takes off and gets approved in other places um ends up here in this country like you said it's already sort of approved here um i don't know if it's approved for animals here but assuming it's you know it is i assume if it's approved for us it's approved for them but when uh when that starts happening there are a lot of pets in the world and if that takes off, that's how you start smoothing out the cost of the process and start expanding and start getting mm -hmm. to a place where maybe it's more affordable. So the pets may, you know, it's how, like how video games improve uh, rendering technologies and make them cheaper and more widely available. Uh -huh. Maybe that's this deal. We just get the pets all into it and then it starts to drop prices. <laughs> and now the human versions are all coming in, you know? I, I get what you're saying. Part of me is resisting it, though, because I think... I tend to want to spend less on my pet's food than I do on my own food. Perhaps I'm a monster, uh, and Seven the dog is judging me right now for even saying that. But uh, if you've got expensive lab-grown meat, I would assume you would be more likely to buy it because you want the, to encourage the sustainability of it, right? This is going to keep, uh, this is going to keep uh, animals from being harmed and growing animals on a farm uh, causes pollution to the environment uh, and, and emissions in, in cases like cows. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm worried about that. If you're against lab grown meat, it's because you want to protect the farmers and you're like, we, we don't, we don't know what this will do to us and we want to protect the farmers and we want to keep people, uh, employed, so I could see resistance to it. It's got to be cheap in any case, even mm -hmm. if you want to do it for the planet. Uh, it can't be that much more expensive, and it's got to be cheap to get mass adoption and overcome the resistance to it. And if it's not cheap, 
making it for pets doesn't seem to me to make it more palatable. Yeah, I, I agree with that. There's a good point there. And I think there's also a consumer expectation that you're never going to be spending more for your pet's food than your own food. Yeah. Just built into people. Um, even if they solve the issue of farmers and ranchers, uh, let's say they all go get their own personal lab meat equipment on the farm. <laughs> well, just tell, tell, your, tell farmer Meg to, <laughs> to get her own lab. Right. And let's say and that I somehow... I see what you... you <laughs> Salt Lake elites say, if it's somehow you know, if it's somehow more affordable, then assuming all these assumptions I that I yeah, have no yeah. basis for, um, I still think that consumer expectation plays a giant role in this. And there's also the marketing of this is a hot new thing. Therefore, you are going to pay more for it, whether we should be or not, or whether the price is justified or not. That's how stuff usually goes at first. Yeah. And there's a longer tail, and then we pay less on the other end. Um, I just, I don't know why, it just feels like this is the right place to start, even though, you know, my brain's trying to go straight to, well, how, when's Scott going to be eating chicken on his table that was made in the lab? When's that happening? And if the dogs have to get us there, then I'll praise canines because that's great. Yeah. Nothing else seems to be pushing it. You know, one thing I hadn't thought of till we were talking just now, uh, a, a lot of nutritionists, actual nutritionists, not, not just people, you know, who, who, who try to sell you their book, uh, a lot of nutritionists say that if you reduce the amount of meat you eat, obviously there there are health risks to, to red meat that are well discussed. Uh, but if you reduce the amount of meat you eat altogether, you end up eating more healthy foods like plants and things like that. Or at least you should. That's the idea. Yeah. So even if it's lab grown, you still have the health consideration except for pets. Right. Pets are supposed to eat a lot of meat. At least dogs and cats are, right? right. Uh, and so... Maybe this is that that's how I plug back into getting us to scale of like, well, I, as a health conscious consumer, don't want to eat more meat, but I could buy this for my pet and know that it is sustainable and helping the environment. Uh, I might do that at a slight expense. Some people might. Uh, more people will do it if it's the same. Well, I should, I should I'm going to buy the lab grown, although some people will resist it because it's lab grown. Mm -hmm. uh, but but in the end, if it's cheaper, that's what people are going to do. So you, you just need to get this cheaper. And to get it cheaper, you need scale. And so now we're back to your original point. Yeah. But I would eat, if I, I guess, bottom line for me, if they're making pet samples, I will, I personally will taste one of the pet samples. I'm please right send now. one to Scott yeah. so that he can taste it on the morning stream. Yeah. And please do it on a Wednesday so I can. <laughs> I can tell you all about it that day. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try it too. I'll join him. Okay. I, I'm not, yeah. Cause you know, I'll eat anything. I'll, so. You'll eat anything. I watched Tom wash a chocolate donut down with a Clamato bottle. So I know what's up with him. That's a true story, yep. folks. Uh, well, folks, what other true stories would you like to hear us talk about? Uh, one way to let us know is our subreddit. Uh, we get we look at the subreddit every day, and sometimes it's just RW Nash in there. Other days, everybody's in there, uh, Motang and everybody submitting stuff. But it doesn't matter. We're always looking at it to see what are the stories those folks think are important. So if you would like to have your voice uh, looked at as what stories in tech are important, go to dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. More video games than ever are adding advertisements, leading to a revolt of gamers and anger across the internet. Or is it? <laughs> Comscore just published the results of its 2024 State of Gaming. Uh, they surveyed just, just shy of 5,000 adults between the ages of 18 to 65 back in March. The respondents all had to say they played video games at least once a month. Uh, and sometimes they were up to multiple times a week. So these were people who were playing games. They weren't surveying non-gamers. About a third of the people they surveyed said that in-game ads affected their gaming experience negatively. That means that two-thirds either said it didn't affect their gaming or that it made it a more positive experience to have an in-game ad. 45% said they didn't mind watching pop-up ads that offered in-game rewards. 55% did. Uh, and 34% said product placement made games feel more real. Now, that still leaves two-thirds of them saying it did not, but, you know, that's a significant percentage, possibly more than you would have guessed. About two-thirds of the people who liked product placement said they would look up more info about a brand because of product placement in a game. Uh, and I think this goes along with all the rest of this. 82% of people surveyed had made an in-game purchase 
in a free game. They yeah. had bought a gem or a donut <laughs> or something, <laughs> uh, you know, some kind of boost uh, along the way. So there's there's a few other things in this survey that I thought were interesting, Scott. But uh, what do you make of this? I thought Variety was a little too positive in saying like, hey, people don't mind ads. No, they they, they do mind ads. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it probably is is less of a minding than we thought. It's the ratio is different than I would have expected. Um, I, I I'll be I, the thing is least surprising to me is the eighty two percent who have made in game or in app purchases. That makes at least sense to once, me. yeah, yeah. Right? That's a normal. I feel like that's a pretty normal thing to do uh, in modern, especially free to play gaming. But the ones that surprised me was the forty five percent that said they didn't mind watching pop up ads that they were that offered in game rewards. I had I had been told multiple times that that was the case that this is an exchange of I'll watch your ad if you give me something in the game, and the more I think about it, that I I do think that is a that's my most favorite version of yeah. this sort of thing. What really threw me though was the people the two thirds who say they would look up more info about a brand they saw in game. That's crazy to me, unless those are so targeted where it's like here I am in a game and there is a game being shown in here that maybe is also interesting to this gamer. So therefore he's going to go check that out later. Uh, otherwise those, those at least in my circles are the things people avoid the most. They just do not want to see product placement uh, in their games and they kind of react viscerally to it, but apparently not in the numbers we thought, you know? Yeah. I, I think the other thing this report shows, again, Variety said gamers' ads don't negatively affect experience, which technically is true. But a lot of people said they don't affect me one way or the other. They don't make it better. They don't make it worse. I take this as people are used to it now. They know it's the price of playing the game. And they don't maybe love it, but they don't let it ruin their day. Yeah. Uh, when people say, I hate ads, they make these games bad... I think sometimes they're just saying that because they want to feel better. They want to get it off their chest or they want a reaction from somebody. They want somebody in a chat room to say like, yeah, man, I agree. And they all agree when in the privacy of their own Comscore survey result, they might go, <laughs> actually, it doesn't really bother me that much. As long as this is anonymous, you know, Yeah. because uh, because people say things that they don't mean all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and And I think on top of that, you know, when you see three people on on social media uh, talk about something, you assume everybody's saying it, and and it may not be the majority. In fact, in this case, a th- it's only a third who say ads are making the game worse for them. Yeah, I also think that um, as much as I've I've been fairly vocal sometimes about some of these trends, I don't like the direction they're heading. I think some of it is predatory. Like I have issues with a bunch yeah, of yeah. it. But all of that being said, it's mostly the the call is coming from inside the house for a lot of gamers. They're doing it. <laughs> like if this stuff didn't work, if it and by work I don't mean it's a trick and you got tricked. I mean they're working marketing plans where they get you to do a thing, and most people are doing the thing. So uh, we can complain all we want. If it didn't work, they wouldn't do it. They would have yeah. other alternatives. They would go with other things. And some stuff comes and goes. You know, loot boxes came. Lots of scrutiny. Lots of complaining from gamers. And eventually you saw loot boxes kind of go the wayside. And there's still some examples, but the prominent ones are gone. Um, So it's not like it can't change and evolve, and it will. It will continue to do that. But I don't think people are as up in arms as they often think they are, even when they're the only one complaining. I think that sometimes they're the ones that are making the purchase or not minding the ad. Yeah. I I think a lot of times, too, we, we complain about the ad that bugged us. Uh, because maybe it, you know, maybe it crashed and broke the game or Mm -hmm. maybe it was particularly badly targeted and you're like, I don't care about this, but we forget all the ads that work because we like them. We forget the one we're like, Ooh, I learned about a new flavor of Oreos and now I bought them and I'm really happy because they taste great. Um, you know, and again, I said this on TMS this morning, but my favorite example is movie trailers. People go seek out movie trailers and watch them on their own. They don't wait for them to be served to them as ads, uh, but they're ads. Uh, so it, an ad is only annoying if it's improperly targeting you. Now, sometimes annoying ads work. Uh, there are definitely times, and I think we can all admit it, where we were really annoyed by an ad, but maybe it ended up influencing a purchase decision. Uh, sure. Those I don't think are as common as you think. The best ads, I think, 
really are ones that you enjoy. You think they're funny. You think they're clever. You talk to other friends about them. They make you feel good about the brand and they lead to you eventually making a purchase or, or somehow interacting with that brand in a positive way. Uh, and there's plenty of ads where you're like, no, I love this movie, this TV show, this singer. I love this food. I love this restaurant. And you can't wait. Like Jack in the Box. Jack in the Box has yeah. a whole fandom around its ads because people love those ads. So, yeah. you know, it's when ads are done well, they are not annoying you. Yeah, they tend... I have friends who I won't name who... Uh, say that they watch the Super Bowl for the ads, but the rest oh, sure. of the, the rest of the year they complain about ads. Um, I, I think you're right, and, and and if you want to know why so much technology is wrapped up in how to better target ads, this is why. This is the whole business now, and AI, lots of AI stuff now too, all moving toward this idea that we need to better personalize and service ads, and that goes up against privacy and all these other issues. It's a bigger conversation, but this is just a this is a part of that market, like anything yeah. else is, and. You know, we either we either like it or we don't, or we do it and we don't realize we're doing it. We're like everybody else, gamers. Yeah. <laughs> sadly, sadly true. Sixty two percent of adults eighteen plus play video games. Yeah. I that actually I would have thought was higher. That would that was about what I expected. I think was that, that just right? gets I think the, the 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 older the generations get, that number just keeps climbing up. Um, I remember that was much lower than that. I also think the, the this other stat about forty percent play across all platforms. That's pretty high, if you can yeah. think about it, because that's a lot All of platforms. Pla like console, PC, mobile, et cetera. Mm. I'm one of those guys, but I always feel like a dodo, like almost extinct in that way. But I, it's probably more common. Well, it's obviously more common than I thought. They also said cloud gaming is on the rise, but I didn't pay for the report, so I didn't get the numbers, and they didn't mm. give those publicly. So I don't think it's rising that much. No, that would have Not been yet. a lead a lead topic if it were. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Hi, Tom, Sarah, Roger, and the rest of the fantastic DTNS team, writes RTJ. I enjoyed the science topics in episode 4811, particularly the segment on bird recognition, and wanted to share my related experience with training a machine learning model to recognize individual koalas. In 2022, while completing my Bachelor of Computer Science Honors in Brisbane, Australia, I was asked to design and train a model to identify individual koalas. I implemented a Siamese network, a type of neural network that compares pairs of images using two identical subnetworks. Each subnetwork processes one of the images to create numerical representations called vectors. The similarity between these vectors is then measured using Euclidean distance. The closer the numbers, the more likely the images are of the same koala. If you're interested, you can find a link to an article in our show notes, and it includes a video outlining the project from Griffith University Koala Movement Project. RTJ says, as I have a face for radio, you can see the back of my head in 47 seconds in the video uh, showing part of the machine learning model I developed. Keep up the great work with the podcast. RTJ, thank you so much for sending this. Uh, go watch this video, folks. It's fascinating. And it's exactly what we were talking about yesterday. I wonder if somebody's doing facial recognition for other kinds of animals out there. And it turns out, yes, as a matter of fact, RTJ did exactly that. Yeah, I'm impressed because koalas, for me, if you're looking at an infrared kind of dark tunnel sort of thing, I'm like, raccoon, small bear, I don't know what <laughs> like, that yeah, is. You can't, yeah, you can't even tell if it's a koala or not, and this thing can tell which koala it is. Yep. Oh, yeah. We've, that's, we've finally that's found that's my frank. favorite application of AI. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, facial recognition for koalas is okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then Ross wrote in and said, greetings from the miserable UK. I'm talking about the weather, of course. And the recent football result oh. was interested to hear the news about Wiz's acquisition. We, we talked about the idea of Google uh, trying to close an acquisition of Wiz, a cloud security environment company. Uh, it's worth noting that Wiz does compete with features like Azure's Defender for the Cloud. And I'm sure that AWS has an equivalent too. Wiz sells to Microsoft and AWS customers, not Microsoft and AWS itself that I know of, but Wiz has a far our superior fe feature set, at least to Microsoft Azure's DFC. So if Google continues to sell into Microsoft and AWS customers, it would be a very smart move. As an enterprise tech listener, I appreciate these news pieces coming through on DTNS. Well, thank you, Roz. Uh, it made me go look uh, kind of poking around to, to see about Wiz and Azure uh, and AWS. And I found an article from Wiz 
where they celebrated being named Microsoft Commercial Marketplace Partner of the Year this year. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, wow. Google might want to keep that up. And thank you, Ross. Appreciate the email. Also, thank you, Scott Johnson. Uh, before we get out of here, what you got going on? Well, um, I had a big reformat of my store and cleared out a bunch of stuff. And I thought, you know what? I like Fallout. Other people like Fallout too. Not the game with the two on it, but also. But also yeah. Yeah, I think I could have said also. Uh, anyway, I made a little bundle of fan art that I created myself and put into 5x5 five five or 8x8 eight eight print packages with free shipping in the U.S. If that sounds interesting to you at all, if you have any love for Fallout, the TV show or the video games, go check it out. That's it. The brand new URL, frogpants.shop. Or you can go to frogpants.com and just click on the store link up at the top of, this, uh, of the page. And I go would love to see a few more people grab these because they're not going to be around very long. That's a great looking Nuka Cola. You're going to want that. Thank you. Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. We found another non gaming use for virtual reality treating eating disorders. Uh, and there's science to back this up. Stick around. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow, talking Netflix with Charlotte Henry. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>